Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA, and I'm your host today. Today's sponsor of Textiles and Tea is Ashford Wheels and Looms, manufacturer of spinning wheels, floor looms, table looms, and more. Uh, also producer of quality fleece and fiber. You can see all of this and more at ashford.co.nz. We will take questions today, as always. If you would, put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. We love your comments, though. Keep adding those in there. We like those, but I won't see the question unless it's in the Q&A. Today, I'm excited that we have Deborah Jarko here. Deborah is a full-time weaver and artist who teaches and lectures on fiber arts. She creates and sells wearables. She has exhibited her works at galleries and museums across the United States. Her commission pieces are held by churches as well as private collections. Deborah loves helping people with discovering the joy of weaving. And during the past several years, she's focused her teaching mostly on rigid heddle looms. She travels extensively and she shares her weaving enthusiasm and expertise. She, as a nationally recognized teacher, is known as a generous educator who makes weaving accessible, exciting, and fun for students of all levels. She is going to bring all of that skill and expertise to Knoxville this summer because she's going to be a teacher at Convergence. We are excited to have her teaching there and I'm excited to have her here today. Hello, Deborah. Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so thrilled that you asked me to, to be a part of this. Oh, we are just pleased you're here. Our first question, very important. What is your favorite tea? <laughs> well, I'm an iced tea drinker, not a hot tea drinker. And I have come to love a tea from Arbuckle Coffee, and it's called Desert Flower. Oh. So I buy it by the pound, and I put it in my pitcher and brew it up. And um, I drink that pretty much all the time. And that's appropriate, because aren't you in the desert? I am. I now live in Prescott, Arizona. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, how did you get started in fiber? How did you get started with all the weaving? Well, like many of the guests that you've had on the show, I've always been involved in some sort of fiber art, you know, my whole life. Um, probably things like uh, cross-stitch embroidery, uh, crochet when I was young and just when I discovered weaving I just felt like I had found the thing I was supposed to be doing. Um, what drew you to rigid heddle and what keeps you there? Why is that that seems to be of such a fit for you? Well I was a production weaver for many years, and um, I had at one time nine floor looms ranging in size from 20 inches to six feet. And um, if you would have asked me at that point, uh, have you worked on a rigid heddle loom, I probably would have said something like, I'm a real weaver, I don't weave on toys, um, which I still hear a lot or similar sentiments from a lot of people. But then I actually tried a rigid heddle loom, somebody gave me one or I don't re even remember how I got the first one. And I tried it and I was totally amazed at how versatile they are and how much fun they are to use. They're portable, they're accessible. Um, and they make weaving so much more approachable for people that have not woven before. And so I just, I love them. And I find myself using my rigid heddle looms all the time. I, I have one loom uh, with one floor loom and um, I haven't even opened it up since I moved to Arizona, which has been about a year. Well, you have such an incredible use of vibrant colors in your work. And I'm curious, does, does your color confidence come to you naturally? Or, or is this something that you had to work at, you had to study? It's um, a natural thing. I look at colors and I put them together until they feel right to me. Of course, I've taken color classes and uh, studied color theory. Uh, but but still, it's more of a feeling for me. Um, a, a lot of times I'll just put things together and 
you know, something doesn't seem right. A lot of times that the background you'll see is my, uh, what used to be my studio before I moved to Arizona. And um, uh, while I would be weaving, I would look at the racks of yarn and think about what colors to put together. And then I would stack cones together to see how I liked them. And as I'd keep weaving on a different uh, project, I would think, no, that one cone has to go and I'll put another one in. And it was always just really fun to envision what I was going to use. I, I, I have a funny story about the uh, image that, on the left, the crosses. Uh -huh. That piece was in an exhibit. And I, I don't know why I put the black cross at the top. It just seemed like it belonged there for some reason. And during the exhibit, uh, during the opening event for the exhibit, one person came over to me and said, I love that you aren't afraid to proclaim your religious feelings. And that, you know, you just put it out there for everybody to see. And I think it's just wonderful. And I smiled and said, thank you. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you like the piece. And probably about five minutes later, a gentleman came over to me and he said, you know, the black cross says it all. We atheists have to stick together. And <laughs> I just loved that, that it was, uh, that it said something so different to do two different people. And it was really the color that conveyed that. So that, that just made me really happy. Oh, that's a great story. That's a great story. Thanks. Well, I know everybody's thinking and asking this, and I'm going to ask it because I'm terrible with color. What helps you get better at color? What's your advice to people? I, I think to, to study it, there are lots of good, um, you know, reference books. There are lots of classes that people offer on color, but, but really I think it boils down to your gut. And, you know, like if it, it, it if it feels right to you, then you should go with it. Yeah, I think a lot of times we get so caught up in doing it right that yeah. we don't listen to that. Yeah. Well, I'm always struck by the initiatives that you take and like teaching at a predominantly knitting and crochet conference stitches, um, your online classes, which you were doing before COVID hit, you were ahead of the game there. Um, you sell your patterns on different platforms. And these are just some of the examples. So have you always been one of those people that thinks outside the box? Well, I always just feel like, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's like when, um, I, I don't know, when somebody asks me to do something or when I think about doing something, it's like, what's, what's the worst ca that could happen? It's just yarn. And I, I mean, you know, how, how bad can it be? And um, I, I don't know, I just, I love playing around with yarn. I, when I first started weaving, I would always put on a warp that was longer than whatever piece I had intended. So that at the end, I had a lot of room that I could just play around. And it's like, oh, I think this color would look horrible in there, but I'm just gonna put some in to see what if. And sometimes I came up with some things that really, um, excited me, you know, because it was just something that I wouldn't have done in a piece on purpose until I had tried that experiment. Um, things like uh, the craftsy classes that I have, when I was first approached about that, I, I was really nervous and I had never done anything on camera before. And it's like, I mean, what's, what's the worst? I could totally humiliate myself. I mean, that's not gonna kill me, right? <laughs> and the, the first um, session that I did when I went there, we, I was so nervous and we started filming and the red light on the camera is, is on and I'm looking at it and we, we were filming for about 10 minutes and I just looked at them and I said, I can't do this. I forgot how to weave. I don't know how to do this anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad. Um, so, you know, so they just said, okay, let's take a little break. And, and then it was okay after that. It's like, uh, okay, it was awful. So now it can only get better. Well, that's so I, yeah, I always just, you know, it's like, I, I think I'm pretty fearless in that respect. Um, I, I love teaching to knitters because weaving is something new to them. 
and uh, in the, it, to, to begin with. And so it's really fun to do that. And I've had to kind of um, rethink my terminology and things like that. And now I teach a lot of times using knitting terms rather than weaving terms for the yarn because it's more relatable. And I just, it's just really fun to try new things. I mean, really, it's just yarn. I'm not gonna, nothing bad is gonna happen. <laughs> I'm gonna have to record this, just that segment. And because we're working on spinning and weaving week and we're getting our vendors lined up to do live video mm -hmm. and um, online. And that's what I'm hearing from. I can't do that. I can't do that. I'll, I'll go on there. I'll just freeze. And that's kind of what I've been saying to them. What's the worst that could happen? You know? Exactly. So, so I you're to, embarrassed. I'm going to tell them to watch this. <laughs> Deborah says it's okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, I mean, well, when I first started doing things like um, I've taught on a couple of cruises and I thought, how ooh. would that work? How, how, how does that even work? Weaving on a cruise, you know, there's so much equipment and stuff and, you know, it's just like, I'll figure it out. And, and it's, it's been really fun. Um, you know, I've had a lot of encouragement from people. So it's, it, it's been great. So you did rigid head along a cruise? Yes. Yes, oh, got another one planned in April. So really? transatlantic cruises are good because you have all those days at sea when you can have class time and then you get to go visit a lot of cool places. So yeah, oh, April, God. Fort Lauderdale to um, Rome. Oh, my God. <laughs> Come on. Don't you need an assistant? <laughs> well, um, another good example of outside the box thinking are your tubes. I love these 3D and especially the ones, the bigger picture, the one on the right, mm -hmm. they just glow. Can you talk about how you came up with this idea? Thank you. I, 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 the, the ones on the left are the first ones I did. Uh -huh. um, I, I, for almost 20 years, had a studio at an art center. That's the background. Um, and uh, we used to do events and things as art centers do. And we were having a jazz festival at the studio. And um, I decided to weave something that was reminiscent of music. So the tubes on the left are, they're called Summertime and they're based on the Gershwin song, Summertime. And the, the uh, each note is a color and the width of the stripe is based on the length of the note. And so I thought when I was a kid, we had a player piano that I learned how to play the piano on. And it had those tubes that you would put in. And I thought, well, that would be kind of fun to make a tube, you know, kind of drawing on the player piano. And um, I liked them so much when I got finished with the tubes. And of course, at that time, I lived in California, earthquake country. And um, people don't want to put a big framed picture over their bed because you don't want it to fall on your head when you're sleeping if there happens to be an earthquake. And I like these so much because they're, they're actually built around um, plastic grid, like for gardens, and that, that, that what gives them its form. And then I have them lined with black felt on the inside and then the fabric is on the outside. And um, if they would fall on your head when you were sleeping, it wouldn't be a big deal. They just kind of bounce off. So um, anyway, so I really liked the tubes and I started, I did a whole series of tubes and the orange and gold ones, um, I really liked those. Of course, they're color studies um, all on one warp, but each tube section is a different weft color. And the, the gold, they're chenille. And the gold chenille just kind of reflects the light so nicely. In a, in a gallery exhibit, of course, you have all the nice lights that shines down on everything. And um, so it was just really nice that they showed off really well, I think. You, you know, it, it, the environment helped them out. Yeah, when I first saw them, we were talking, I said, are those lights? You know, I just, I knew there was some kind of light bulb in some because of that glow, it's great. Thanks. Um, the another piece that they are coming up right now are these liturgical hangings, and they are truly amazing. I, I would love to walk into a church and have these greet me. So, a couple of questions. One, how did you um, design this? What was the design process for something this large? And how did you find a church, or did the church find you? Um, to do something that original. 
you know, with a fiber. Uh, I'll start with the second question first. It, it, when you first started the uh, the intro to to our uh, discussion, uh, there was a picture of a red wall piece, a big long red wall piece. I made that specifically for an exhibit in a gallery and I wanted it to kind of hang on the fly. Anyway, so I, I made that for an exhibit in a gallery. It was probably 25 feet long um, and each panel was about 20 inches wide. And uh, it, was, it was in the gallery and um, a woman was there, you know, in the gallery viewing the exhibit and uh, the landscaper happened to walk through the gallery and he saw the red piece and he stopped and knelt down and made the sign of the cross. Um, it, it affected him like that. And then he went on his way. And so this woman that just happened to be there um, saw this. And a few months later, her church was, uh, looking around for banners to hang in their church. It's this church that, that is, it, that's in the images. And uh, she remembered that. And so she, they approached me and asked me, you know, have you ever done any liturgical weavings? And I said, no. And so we talked about it. And uh, the green ones were the first ones I did. And, um, you know, I looked at the space, there was this brown wall and they just said, you know, we want something in greens. They showed me the priest's vestments and the colors of green that they had. And, you know, what do you think? Uh, what, what do you come up with? So I came up with three or four different designs that would fill the space and draw the eye towards the crucifix because even though I'd like to think my art is the thing, you, you know, the, the, it, the crucifix is the main event here. And so I wanted something that would draw the eye into the crucifix. So I designed three panels on each side, bringing the eye in and the outer panels are darker than the middle ones are a little bit lighter and the ones in the center are even lighter. So you're all, your eye comes in to the center. And um, the thing that I found amazing about doing liturgical pieces is most churches are really dark and so I had to put a lot of uh, glittery yarn in my pieces. You couldn't tell it, they're mostly rayon chenille, but they have a lot of sparkle yarn in them besides, otherwise they just kind of faded into the background. So it was a lot of fun stuff to play with. Oh, that's amazing. I, I'm glad you said that about they're dark to light. I just assumed that was the light reflecting off of them. I didn't realize that you yeah. um, actually changed the, the color in the pieces. Um, Whitney, can you show the red again? Somebody, people are asking if they can see the red. She's my technical wizard. I know she can do this. She's cursing me, I know, but. No <laughs> way. <laughs> do that. Um, there you go. That was a great story though. That, that's an amazing happening. I, I got goosebumps when you were telling the story oh, of the man kneeling. That, that's you. pretty impressive. It, it, it's a terrible picture. Um, <laughs> You know, that the one is kind of yellow. The one on the right is kind of yellow. Mm -hmm. The one on the left is kind of blue. And the one in the center is all reds. Um, and it's also a Fibonacci based series of stripes and oh, color right, gradations. Right. So, um, you know, anyway, I, I, I really enjoyed making that piece and it certainly led to a lot of good things. Obviously, that's amazing. Thanks. Well, you also do wearable art. Um, you so do when you're planning um, something that you're going to wear. Do you find that you have to kind of shift your thinking and how you design, such as this gorgeous blue jacket and then this really great, unique Day of the Dead jacket? So you, do you have to approach it differently, or a little bit differently? It's on a different scale, but still, oh. I. I I use a lot of things for ins inspiration. The, the Day of the Dead Garment was for an exhibit at, uh, or for a fashion show slash exhibit at uh, the Ventura County Museum in California. And um, I, I wanted something, it, when uh, Day of the Dead, the, the image that flashed in my mind when I thought about that was the old Boris Karloff movie where it, you know he was wrapped in the mummy wraps and his hand was always reaching out and there was, there were, you know, like rags hanging off of him. And so I wanted to do something that evoked that kind of feeling. So um, I came up with this open weave felted 
piece and all the little beads that you'll see around it, uh, around all the fringed areas, the beads are all hand carved wood uh, beads, skulls, hand carved wood skull beads that I found somewhere. And so it has these little skulls all over it and they're all hanging down in her face. And um, it was just a hoot to do. I had so much fun doing that one. Um, the blue one, somebody wanted something that was based on water. And uh, so I found this wonderful picture of, of a lake and the sky. And um, I just kind of um, copied the colors in this photograph that I had seen. So it, it's just, I love it when people give me something that they want me to evoke. Uh, one woman one time when I designed a garment for her um, gave me a picture of her cat and she said, I love my cat and I want something. And it was, it was a tabby cat. I want something that is in my, you know, reminds me of my cat. So I got to weave a piece with all of her beautiful cat colors. It was great. What inspiration. Yeah. Well, I have to ask, what happened to the Day of the Dead jacket? Did someone buy it? Is it being worn somewhere? Somebody bought it. Oh, a good. woman fell in love with it and she bought it. And I just thanked my lucky stars because I didn't know what I would do with it. Oh, that, I would love to have a piece like that. That is great. <laughs> well, you have been such an inspiration for so many weavers. And, you know, you teach people and they just take off. So who is or has been your inspiration for your work? There have been lots of people that I've been inspired by. Learning to Weave, the book by Deborah Chandler, was mm -hmm. such an inspiration to me when I got started. There weren't Zoom classes. There weren't, I, I didn't have access to a lot of classes. And that book really helped me get going. And um, so she's always been an inspiration to me. And I took some classes from uh, Anita Luvera Mayer. Um, oh, at really? Convergence and different places. And um, I've always, one of the classes that I took first from her was plain weave is anything but plain. And to me, that just opened up so many possibilities. Um, Michael Rohde, who's one of my very dear friends and a, a really accomplished weaver. When I had first started weaving and I didn't know Michael then, he gave a presentation for our guild where he showed his, his career kind of in weaving. And he showed a picture of one of the first rugs that he ever wove. And it was not one of his best pieces. I mean, but he was showing it because it's where he came from. And that inspired me. It's like if, if Michael started there, there's hope for me. I, <laughs> You know, um, so um, I always have thanked him for that. And, and my students are a big inspiration. They, they come up with such wonderful ideas and it's always so thrilling to see where you can take things. Yeah, Michael's gonna be here October 5th during Spinning and Weaving Week. And so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from him too. I've heard a lot of people say he's had an impact. Oh, we, we, we shared a studio for many years. I mean, until I moved oh. to Arizona, we've, we've been studio mates and, um, and we're theater partners. We always had theater tickets together. So really? um, yeah, I mean, Michael's such a good guy. Well, you share that is that you're both our inspirations. You've really helped the weaving community uh, to move on and keep going. Thank you. So when you're creating, how do you stay creative? And maybe this doesn't happen to you, but do you ever feel like you get stuck or you're kind of burned out? Or So if you do get to that point, do, what do you do to get out of it? How do you move on? Um, I'm inspired a lot by deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, commit to things and then I have to do something. So, you know, it's like if I, if I um, know I've got a conference coming up or a, a teaching job and I want a new class, I know that I have to do something for it. So that's an inspiration for me. And, and I've always, I'm always right down to a deadline. I mean, you know, it's like the night before I'm finishing something. Um, and I love that. It, it keeps me motivated and moving or, you know, like I, there's an a deadline for an exhibit or something. 
um, writing a book, I, I have a deadline. So, oh my gosh, I have to get these, these projects done. So I, I, I love having deadlines and I, I love having things that I aspire to, like I want to be a part of that. So I have to get my act together and get something done. <laughs> so that's, that's a huge inspiration for me. Well, I'm getting a new studio soon, so I think I'm going to cross stitch that as a plaque. My inspiration comes from dot, dot, dot deadlines. <laughs> I like that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you've are you got a book, right? You've got a book, and it's called, there it is, The Weaving Explorer, and you wrote this with Gwen Stege. I did. Um, now, taking on a book is not a small task, and I ask everybody who <laughs> comes on why? What was involved in deciding to take on something? It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It's fun. I, um, I wanted to write a book on rigid heddle weaving. Mm -hmm. And Gwen was uh, an editor for story books. Oh, okay. And so I, I kept talking to Gwen about this book that I wanted to write, but they were in the process of putting together Sign Mitchell's book that they published on rigid head all weaving. And she said, we just don't wanna do two at the same time. And then I ran into her at TNNA, uh, I, I can't remember when it was. And she said, you know, but I've been thinking about it would be wonderful to have a book on all these different creative types of weaving, not rigid heddle weaving, but all these off loom techniques and unusual kinds of things, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And would you consider doing something like that? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, Gwen, I, I, I would consider doing something like that, but it sounds like too big of a project to do alone. Would you do it with me? So that's, that's how we we came to to doing this book and it was really a labor of love um oh, all all the things that we had you know tr tried maybe years past and wanted to explore a little bit more there's a little tapestry a little basket weaving a little back strap a little diagonal on peg loom weaving there's all kinds of stuff in there and it was it was just really a lot of fun i've heard some people say that working on a book really changed them in some ways. Did you find it really impacted either you as a person or your work or? I think it impacted my work and it helped me think in a more orderly fashion, I'll oh. say, you know, and of course there were all those deadlines. <laughs> It got you more creative. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it just, it, 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 I think it helped me look at things in a little bit different way. I've always been, well, for the last 20 years or so, I've been tuned in to teaching what I know and how, how do I verbalize this or write this so that it's uh, clear to somebody else and not just my scribbled little notes that I make for myself. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I think it changed the way I think about how I present things. I can see that, yeah. Do you ever go, I wrote a book, I wrote a book. <laughs> well, I am very proud of it. And, and, and I, I am really happy that, that it's happened. And um, I know we were gonna, I think we were going to touch on this later, but I have another book coming out at, by the end of this year that I'm really, really excited about. It is that Rigid Heddle book, and it's in partnership with Ashford. So, you know, that it's, it's the Rigid Heddle book, and my concept on it was that you would um, learn how to weave by doing projects. So each project, I think it's 32 projects in the book, and <laughs> each project you learn a new skill. The, the first one being just a beginning, a, a weave, you know, weave a scarf, beginning ideas. And there's all sorts of good ideas on yarn substitutions because, you know, the yarn is always discontinued or a lot of times when you go to do a follow a pattern or do a project. And so I talked a lot about what yarn you could substitute and what you needed to look for and how you could make it different. So I'm really excited about it. And it's like, it's, it's so it really is exciting to, to have a book or books. So thank you, Ashford. <laughs>
So it sounds like it, it can kind of, um, you can kind of walk through it and take it step by step and not teach yourself, but kind of move yourself along in your improving as a weaver. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it goes, like I said, from the very beginning, it goes through uh, using two heddles and making double layers of cloth and um, all, all making garments, all, all kinds of fun stuff. So um, I'm very proud of it. And I can't oh, wait wow. for it to come out. And will it be ready by, are gorgeous. Will it be ready by Convergence? I, yes, I think it's going to be out by the end of the year. We're crossing oh, okay. fingers. Yeah. I think you even said that. Sorry. Oh, that'll be great. You know, you'll be there teaching. You'll have your book there. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. What fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, people often say that, oh, you, you weave for a living or you're an artist. That's so much fun, I bet. And I don't think people realize kind of like the deadline thing, you know, doing that's hard work too, as well as there's enjoyment in it, I'm sure. But so in the art process for you, what is fun for you? Is it, are there parts, like some people say they enjoy putting on a warp, but you know, some people say they enjoy that. Or some people say, I really like the design process or whatever. Where is the fun for you when you're working? It's all fun. All parts okay. of weaving are fun for me. I, I, I do, I like warping. I like winding a warp what, if I'm using a floor loom because I get to feel the yarn going through my hand. You know, it's like, it's almost like I get to fondle the yarn as I'm, as I'm winding the warp. And um, I, I really enjoy that and making it be all orderly and, you know, all lined up. And I mean, I, I'm a Virgo, and so I have that, you know, like it all needs to be in order. Um, so I, I love that part of it. I, I like tying on. I like getting it all, you know, neat. I mean, I really, I, I love every part of weaving. Um, each has its own appeal. When, when I was a production weaver, a lot of times I would just get into winding a warp mode and I would wind, you know, five or 10 warps and really just hang them on the wall so that you know like when I got around to it because if I was just having fun winding warps um it, I don't know and weaving is fun and uh, the planning part is really fun planning what I'm going to do and figuring out how many warp threads are each color and how they're going to uh, if it is it lino so how is that going to cross over and how is it going to look and I mean it, it's just I love that. And of course the weaving is fun. I go off into kind of a Zen place. I do a lot of plain weave and, and a lot of simple weave structure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can just kind of, well, like I said before, look at the yarn and think about what I'm gonna do next or plan a different project or, you know, just admire how the weaving is looking. It's, it's all so fun and exciting. I mean, I just really, really enjoy it. The thing that I don't like so much is marketing and promoting myself. Hmm. That I find that difficult. I, I send out a, um, you know, my intent was once a month, I send out, a, 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 let's not glorify it and call it a newsletter, a, a <laughs> list of what classes I'm going to teach. That's, it's just a list. And, um, you know, e even doing that and putting the MailChimp thing together and getting it sent out, it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to do it every month and it, I'm lucky if it happens every three months, just because I, I just, it's not my thing, you, you know, or, or promoting myself on Facebook. I, I don't do a lot of that or, it, you know, I, it, it's, that's the difficult part for me. Um, but everything about weaving, I love every part of it. What about the traveling and the teaching and is that enjoyable? Are there parts of that you just soon not do? Or I I love teaching. I love the enthusiasm. I yeah, love we can tell you that. like teaching. Yeah. You're good at that. <laughs> Thanks. I, I just it just really is exciting. I mean, there are times when I think, oh, well, I used to. You know, I it, oh gosh, I've got to go be away for a week again, and you know, kind of like oh man, another trip. And and then I'd get there, and it would be so fun, and I'd be so happy I was there. Um, I, up until COVID hit, I was traveling two to three times a month to teach, and that was a lot. 
I had pretty much decided I needed to cut back some. And then of course, when we couldn't teach at all, it was, it was a big panic thing. Like, oh my gosh, there's, there, all, everything is canceled. You know, I, I think I had like six conferences booked, including Convergence. And it's like, boom, 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 they're all canceled. And this is awful. And I really missed doing it. And, and then I started doing Zoom thinking, I, how the heck am I going to teach weaving on Zoom? Because it's so hands-on and um, it was a big challenge. And um, I practiced a lot and my friends were so helpful. And, you know, like, will you, can I teach you a trial run class? And will you tell me all the things I'm doing wrong? Um, you know, and so they were really good about helping me get over that hump of, uh, you know, like, so what's the worst that could happen? You know, I'm awful at it. Uh, and <laughs> so anyway, so I, I'm teaching now mostly two to three times a month on Zoom. And it's it's really good. I, I have my next in-person uh, teaching event is not till March. So, um, you know, but I'm teaching a lot on Zoom and it's really fun. I figured out a way to show the back of the loom and the front of the loom. And uh, I usually have three cameras when I'm, when I'm. Oh, uh, there you go. There you go. So it's, it's good. You know, it's amazing what you can do if you really work at it. Um, and that's fun for me because it's like, how can I, how can I make this clear so that people get it? Um, you know, because it's intimidating to do something new or a technique that's new. And, you know, and the teacher isn't there to help you to put the hands on. So anyway, I'm just going on and on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I love that. I love that. Yeah. It just comes across so clearly how much you love teaching. Um, and how it just, it just feeds you, I can tell. It's, it's yeah. great to hear you talk about it. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question that it, it may be very obvious, but how do you decide which loom to use? Is it just a strictly size that if it's not very big, you're going to do the rigid handle? If it's something big, you have to use a floor loom? Or? Well, like I said, I haven't used one of my floor looms in quite a while. Yeah. Um, because I'm always trying to come up with new things for rigid handle. And I feel like I found my little corner of the world, you know, teaching, teaching rigid handle um, ha has really become my passion. I feel like I can reach so many more people because one of the things that kept me from learning to weave when I started was I didn't want to buy a big floor loom. And then what if I don't like it? I mean, I, I thought I was going to like it, but you know, I mean, there are lots of things I thought I was going to like, and then I actually tried it and it was like, no, not for me, but it's a good thing I took this class because I learned it's not my thing. Right. Um, so, you know, I didn't want to spend the money and I didn't know anybody to teach me. To, to weave. And so a rigid heddle loom is so much less of an investment um, and so easier, so much easier to get involved with that um, I, I, I really gravitate towards it. And I have probably with me, uh, I don't know, 12 or 14 rigid heddle looms ranging in size from eight inches to, I think my biggest one is 24 inches that I have here. And I will always use the smallest loom I can for the project I'm doing. So among my rigid heddle looms, that's what makes me decide. Why the smallest? Because it's so much easier to use. Oh, okay. And, and I really, and I encourage beginners to buy small looms, to buy like the 10 inch looms um, because it is so much easier to manipulate. I mean, I, I compare it to if you're learning to drive, is a little small car easier to manipulate than like a SUV? You know, it's just it's just easier to, to use. And so it helps you get started and it helps you be successful right off the bat. So since I encourage so many people to buy small looms, I've gotten into designing things that are woven on small looms. And so you can, you can make big garments, but you make them on a small loom and you sew them together. So that's one of my uh, missions now. Your mission, I like that. Well, I feel like we've kind of answered this next question, but in case we haven't caused, covered everything, what's next for you? So you've got a book coming out. You're going to be at Convergence. You start teaching in person in March. March? March. What else is coming up on around? Well, there's, there's the, uh, the cruise to Rome in April. That's pretty <gasps> there exciting. You go. Oh, yeah. you're going to Rome? 
Rome, yeah, from Fort Lauderdale to Rome. Um, and then I've got a couple of tours that I'm uh, going on, uh, help, hoping other weavers will come along with me. Uh, next September is a tour to Peru uh, with an optional extension to Machu Picchu. So we're going to be exploring all kinds of weaving things there in Peru. Uh, we'll be in uh, uh, Cusco a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll be lots of fun. Um, and then in February of 22, so that's a long time away, a weaving tour to New Zealand. And we're going to go visit Ashford there when we're there. Oh, and, that's and explore great. all kinds of weaving things, yeah. So that'll be fun. And that's in 22 or 23? Oh, 23, sorry. Okay. Yeah. It was supposed to be in 22, but you know, it was looking like February of 22, we might not be ready to travel that yeah. big of a trip again. So um, now people can get information on your website about this. Yes, if you go to the website, I have one page that's called classes and class schedule, everything's on there. And it always has links to whatever, you know, wherever I'm teaching or the tours or the cruises or whatever. So I'm, I, I just feel like I'm so lucky that I get to do what I love and interface with so many wonderful people. I mean, it's just, what could be a better job? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, maybe hosting a talk show where I get to talk to great people like you. <laughs> well, there is that, yeah. There is that. Well, you know, we got bunches of questions. So why don't we start looking at those? Um, Lori Zollinger, uh, what kind of rigid hill do you use? I have and learned on a Becca and it's about worn out. Well, I've never used, well, I have used Becca, I don't own a Becca, but I have used Beccas from people in class, um, you know, that I, when I've tried to help them. Um, Ashford is my favorite loom, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I gravitate towards Ashford a lot. I love their little 10-inch sample at loom uh, for people to get started with. Um, if you're looking for bigger looms, I mean, it, you can get a rigid heddle loom anywhere from eight inches to 48 inches wide, which is huge. Oh, really? I've never seen one that big, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, so, so the Ashford sample at Loom is a really good beginner loom. It's inexpensive, it's easy to use. It's already equipped for double heddles for when you're ready to go there. So it, it's a good one to get started with. Shaft makes some really good looms also. They have two different models, um, one kind of budget the Cricut and the other they're, they're um, good. I mean, they're you know higher end, uh, more finished wood, that kind of thing, the flip. Um, and they range in size from the Cricut is 10 inches and you can get the flip up to, I think 30 inches. I, I think that's as big as they go. They go 15, 20, 25, 30, um, you know, also good looms. Um, um, Kromsky makes some good looms. The, uh, my favorite of theirs is the Presto. It's their newest model. It's a really adorable little loom. You can get it in uh, 10 or 15 inch models. But I, I, I really do. I find when I go in, and I have all, all of those. I mean, I have. It's uh, as, I, as I tell myself, since I'm teaching so many people on different kinds of looms, it's my job to make sure I have one of every kind so yes. that I can try them out and be familiar when I need to help somebody. That's right. That's your story and you're sticking to it. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've already got somebody sold on your tour. Marcia Steele style says, Fort Lauderdale to Rome in April, a weaving cruise. I'm not busy that day. <laughs> so I think she signed <laughs> up. Um, Carol Davinsky said, and I'm assuming she's talking about the um, liturgical work. She says, lovely gradation of colors. Do you dye? I meant to ask you that too. Do you dye your yarn? No, I okay. am not a dyer. My friend Michael is such an exquisite dyer. I do not like the whole rinsing process that goes with dyeing. And it's just, it's, I've taken classes. It's not my thing. <laughs> but as you can see, I have so much yarn that I'm usually able to find the color I want. This is only a, this is only maybe a third of the yarn that was in the studio. 
that you can see in the background there. I love it. Um, oh, I think you just answered this question. Betty Womack says, are you sitting in your private studio or is this a weaving classroom? This is your old studio. This is a picture of your old studio behind you, right? Right, and it okay. was my studio. I did do some classes there, but, but if people were going to take a class in my studio, they didn't use my floor looms, they brought their own. I mean, they brought their own tabletop or, or small loom because I always had projects on all of my looms. I had nine floor looms at one time, but um, it, yeah, this I, I moved out of my studio last year or earlier this year, I should say. And we're in the process of building a house and I'm building a studio into the house. So right now I'm in a little teeny room and um, that's why I have the virtual background. <laughs> now, when you do the cruise, do they have to bring their own loom or do you provide those? Uh, generally they bring their own loom. And if they, if they don't have their own loom, I can, I can sell them one to bring on the cruise, but if if I had to take all the looms there, it would be too much. Yeah, and that and all the projects are designed for ten inch wide looms, so they easily fit in a suitcase. You know. The, oh, and, oh, okay, all right. And and usually one of the projects is you know a wider piece, so we see how to sew something together. All right, Pamela Casey said, will you have your rigid heddle book for sale at Convergence? I think we determined, yes, you will, right? Um, she said she has signed up for two of your classes and she's looking forward to learning from you. Oh, so, wonderful. Wonderful, Pamela, we'll see you in Knoxville. Um, Rondi Schmidt, are these pieces warp and weft chenille or just the warp? Oh, when you were talking about chenille, were they the warp or the weft or both? Both. They're both. Really? Your warp yeah. was chenille? Yeah, warp and weft chenille. And I used to put on, um, when I was doing the produ produ production weaving or weaving the liturgical pieces, I would put on usually 30 to 40 yard warps. And I warp front to back and it always would look at, like a big pile of spaghetti in front of the room. <laughs> and people would be horrified when they would see it, but it all would go on really cool. So, you know. Way to go. Um, yeah. Um, Fozzie Riz, Rizvi, some of your lovely pieces have specialized ways of hanging them. How do you go about deciding how they should hang? This is a great question. Uh, where do you have the hardware made or do you find them? That's a really good question. That is a great um, question. The, the, it, over my head, you can see those gray pieces hanging from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, there was a plastic, near my studio in Camarillo, California, there was a plastics place, manufacturing place, close by to there. And uh, for, for many of my long pieces like this, I would buy one inch diameter plastic rods and they would cut them to this width that I wanted them. And then I, I these are just, um, they're hooks in the ceiling. That, that's one of those, uh, you know, uh, acoustic tile ceilings with the metal. So I have hooks over the metal area and then I use monofilament to come down and tie the monofilament around the plastic rod. Oh, okay. And so they're, they're kind of like free hanging. Um, in some places, like in the church where I did the, the several pieces, the several um, installations for the one church with the brown wall, they actually manufactured and, and put together a pulley system to raise and lower a big rod that they used uh, to, for that installation. It depends on the particular place. I used those uh, plexiglass dowels a lot and, and monofilament. Sometimes I wanted to get the pieces if they were hung on the wall out from the wall so that they could ripple a little bit in the, mm -hmm. in the air. Um, and so I would have um, something that would keep them away from the wall. I had some things made that were the uh, plastic dowels um, that then they would fit into, it, it, it was a challenge. They, they were, depended on the ins installation. Uh, well, Pamela, I think we just answered your question about displaying projects in public places. Um, 
Now, Jennifer Verrill is asking about the tubes that the big round tubes you made. And she said, um, and you may have answered this, but let me ask it again. Was, were the cloth woven on a loom and then wrapped around the tube? They were, weren't they? Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I, and like for the for the different sets of tubes, like the gold and orange ones, since since we saw those, uh -huh. it was one warp and at chenille. And then I wove, um, you know, I knew how much I needed to go around a particular size tube that I wanted to make because those were all, you know, actually I designed all the tube pieces so that they would fit inside of each other. So for shipping, I could just stuff one inside the other and then I would just have one tube with all the others inside of it. Um, so I would know how long I needed to weave to get it to go around each diameter of tube. And so I would weave that in a color, then go to the next color. And then I would use the uh, plastic grid stuff for gardens. It's, it's stiff, mm -hmm. uh, plastic stiff grid that I got at like Home Depot or somewhere. And I would make that into the tube and then cover it with black felt. Uh, what was the length and the width of the liturgical pieces? Um, I think the long, it depended on the pieces. I wove a lot of them. Uh -huh. um, it, I, I think the widest piece was about 50 inches wide. I, I don't think you saw any of those here. That was a, a Unitarian church I did. I think the widest piece was about 50 inches wide after I took it off the loom and wet finished it. Um, the narrowest was about 10 inches. That was one image that we did see in the white and gold installation. And that one had panels that were 27 feet long. And because I wanted it to ripple some in that particular piece, I, um, even though the warp was rayon chenille, I used rayon sewing thread for the weft, two panels, 27 feet long. I was just kicking myself because I had a deadline, you know, and um, <laughs> the, the rayon sewing thread weft took forever. Yeah, two, two, two panels, 27 feet long. That was, what was I thinking? <laughs> You're a better woman than me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Rhonda Schmidt wants to know, do you spin? No, I've tried spinning. I had a spinning wheel. Uh -huh. And, um, it, you know, I, I, I spun a little bit and I enjoyed it, but then I realized that my spinning wheel was sitting on my fireplace hearth um, and, it, and the only thing that was being spun on it was cobwebs. And so <laughs> I gave it away, um, oh. you know. <laughs> um, I think you've got a ringer here with the question. Uh, Kathleen Staples said, your classes are such a great combination of detailed and comprehensive instruction and freedom, fun and spontaneity. Um, can you talk a bit about that? <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. How much do you have to pay her? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it is, I'm sure. Um, I, don't, I, think it should, I think weaving should be fun. I mean, that's, the, yeah. you know, people should have a good time. And I, I, I am, a, you know, I always felt like there were two schools of thought. There are the color texture weavers and there are the complex weavers. I never fit into, I, I've done complex weaving, but it's not my thing. You know, I, 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 I prefer to uh, be more freeform in what I'm doing. And, you know, that throws your complex pattern off. So I, I just want everybody to have a good time. Yes, there are principles that I like to impart, but you know what, if it doesn't turn, I mean, again, if it doesn't turn out the way it was originally intended to be, it's, it's cool, it's still cloth, it's fabulous. You, you know, so have a good time and, and, and enjoy what you're doing. I always feel like no matter, even if I don't like my piece when I'm done, it's like reading a book. What do you have to show when you finish reading a book? You could spend a lot of time reading a book, but you've gained knowledge and you've enjoyed the process, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're weaving, if you end up with something that you really don't like, you've still enjoyed the process and you've learned something about weaving. So what, what could be wrong? I mean, it's fun. I don't know if that answered Kathy's question or not, but I went off oh, on a good. tangent. 
Um, we got a lot of how-to questions that I think are um, better sent to you on your website. Um, yeah. I don't want this you to be a workshop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is kind of a, 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 this is an interesting question. We might not have enough time for it, but <laughs> how did you go from being a beginning weaver to someone who exhibits? I know people are always curious, how do you start exhibiting? I, I don't know if that's the gist of this question, but how well, did you go I, from beginner? Yeah, I was very fortunate that I had friends that exhibited a lot, like Michael. Oh, okay. And so, um, and my other studio mates who have also been quite an inspiration to me. Um, I just kept doing stuff. And my first exhibit piece was at Vancouver Convergence, however long ago that was. I entered in, into the exhibits, the HGA exhibits, I entered pieces because there were so many categories you could enter in. And I would enter stuff and mostly I got rejected and okay, that's what happens. But, but my first piece was a scarf in, in one of those exhibits. And I was thrilled and it, it just, you know, and then going there and seeing it on the wall and there's my name on the wall. And I mean, how cool is that? I was just so thrilled that I wanted to keep on doing it. And I think the big thing is not to be afraid of being rejected. You know, again, what's the worst that can happen? It, they, they don't take it, but that's okay because I've still learned something and I've put myself out there and, um, you know, I, I can try again. And that, that means so much coming from someone who's, you know, you're so well respected, you're very well known. And to hear you say that you got rejected, it, sure. it does give the rest of us hope. Thank you for sharing that part of it. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> well, it's hard to believe, but we have to stop for today. Okay. I've had such a good time, Deborah. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. It's always nice chatting with you. Well, if you want to learn more about Deborah's work and learn about the cruise, we're all going to be there. <laughs> Rome, Richard Heddle, what more could you ask for? Um, all of that is on her website and she has lots of images of her works. I know we, everybody wants to see more, but there's more there. Uh, if you have questions, you can direct those through her website also. And that is DebraJarko.com. And I encourage you to go. Um, and also she lists her where she's teaching. If you're curious about either the online teaching or in person, she keeps all of that on her website. Even though she makes it sound like she doesn't do a good job doing that, she really does. It's a great <laughs> website. Um, I do want to say thank you to Ashford Wheels and Looms. Um, come see, you can go see their new yarns. Um, they have new equipment. Speaking of Rigid Heddle, their new Rigid Heddle stand is out. And I guess it's one size fits all their Rigid Heddle looms. Um, they have an e-ball binder. I want to see that at Convergence. I'm going to see what that looks like. Um, they, they announced their uh, textile awards on there and where you can purchase their products. They'll tell you where to head to your local distributor of Ashford. So go check all of that out at ashford.co.nz. If you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your guild or your business, um, please go to uh, the website and there's all kinds of information how you too can become a sponsor. Uh, we want to also supporting textiles and tea is the fiber trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, uh, please donate or join and you can do that on weavespendie.org. And if you're speaking of more programs like this, we have big stuff coming up in October, Spinning and Weaving Week 2021, sponsored by Long Thread Media. Um, there's gonna be panels. There are um, the Marketplace Live. You can see your favorite vendors and see what's new and exciting. Um, we've got thread talks. We've got um, studio tours. Those were so popular last year. And most importantly, we've got the informal fashion show. All of you who said you wish you've done it last year, now here's your chance. Come show off what you worked on during COVID. We'd love to see it. Um, if you've missed an episode and you would like to see it again, uh, you want to share it with a friend, all the textiles and tea are on Facebook. You do not have to have a Facebook account to watch. You can just go on and watch whatever episode you'd like to see. Um, we're also putting them up on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube and you subscribe, you'll get a notice saying that another uh, episode has been uploaded. So I encourage you to do that. 
Next week, we have Bosali Biswas going to be here. We're so excited to have her here. Deborah, again, thank you. What a lovely afternoon to have you here and just chat. Um, thank you all for being here this afternoon. We'll see you next week. Happy tea. Thank you. Thanks for